workers and to the mayor of Cherry and said, what can you tell me about John Tintori or the Cherry Mine disaster? And so I started getting bits and pieces of the story. It was like a jigsaw puzzle all out of context. And the mayor of Cherry put me in touch with Jack Rooney, whose grandfather survived. And someone else put me in touch and said, you need to call Ed Caldwell. And so I had a wealth of information starting to come in. And I had, I, my major is in journalism. I had written fiction and nonfiction books uh, by this time. And, I'm, and Jack Rooney had said he was going, he was accumulating all of this information. He was one day going to write a book about this. So I kept forestalling until I actually was sitting in the movie theater watching Titanic and said, my God, Karen, this is a story. You're sitting on a story that is Titanic in a coal mine. You've got to write the book. The Cherry Mine disaster never, ever should have happened. Here we are 100 years later, and I'm, I'm so grateful to the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library for having this program tonight, for having the wonderful exhibit, and bringing this disaster to a, a greater audience. How many times have we met people, you know, even, out, even in Illinois, I've met people from Chicago, teachers, other writers, Cherry? They don't know anything about the disaster, which still stands 100 years later as our country's worst coal mine fire for loss of life. There are only two others that it's third behind for total loss of life, but those were mine explosions. And it, it had great historical significance. The coal mine disaster settlement was the first application of workers' compensation law in this country. Maryland in 1902 had uh, passed some workers' compensation acts for miners, but this and, and England had <coughs> done workers' compensation in 1906. But in the settlement of this disaster, it was the fir its first application in a real situation and was the impetus for, for the Illinois, Illinois workers' compensation law and other workers' compensation laws in this country. It also spurred the mine rescue stations uh, when the Cherry Mine disaster happened, rescuers came from Pennsylvania and from Urbana, Champaign area, and there was a delay in getting them there to help with the, with the rescue. So that also, the mine rescue that we saw going on at Kew Creek with the, little, with the little yellow capsule going up and down. During the Cherry Mine disaster, the rescue capsule was a half a whiskey barrel with two men with their inside legs in the bucket, their outside legs out of the bucket, and some electrical wire and clothesline lowering them down into a burning mine. So it, had, it, it changed state mining laws, it changed child labor laws. It's, it's a very historically significant disaster that needs a wider audience. Cherry, people say, where's Cherry? Cherry is, was the northernmost coal field in the state of Illinois. And it was the end of the line for many of the people who came from Europe to work in this mine. The coal company had sent engineers to look for new veins of coal, and they found a treasure trove under Cherry, which is, a, if you want to say, it's north central Illinois, about 90 miles southwest of Chicago. And they found a vein so rich that they figured they could mine this out for 50 years. And unlike other mining towns where the men only worked a half a year, the men in Cherry were going to be working every day because the St. Paul um, Railroad could use this coal for its buildings, for its railroad, and its mining company was just, you know, these people here were going to be working constantly. They built a model town. The houses were different. It was the Jewel, the railroad station. They built a spur track from Ladd, three miles out from Ladd. And the train actually came and then went backwards back to Ladd. So it was the end of the line. Most of the were, uh, immigrants who came here were Italians. But the town uh, was built in 1904 to 1905. The mine opened. And you had people like the Tower of Babel. People were working and living next to other immigrant families they couldn't understand. The day of the mine disaster was a Saturday morning, November 13th. A lot of people left at midday, only worked a half a day. But that morning, 481, 480, various accounts, men and boys dropped into the mine 
to work. It was on two veins. One was about 350 feet down, and the other one was about 480 feet down. And the, the, um, there were two entrances into the mine. The main shaft had two cages. They were like pistons. So when one cage came up to, to get men, the other one was a counterweight and went down. And then when that one went down, the other one came up to get men. And that was used to drop men into the mine to the second vein and to bring coal up from the second vein. At the air shaft, there was a big fan that was blowing air in for ventilation to the mine. There was a single cage that went down, but it only went to the second vein. There were, the, there were no cages that went down to the third vein. The men in the third vein came up through that air shaft, the escapement shaft. There was a 10-foot ladder, then there was a wooden staircase, and then there was another ladder. And so they came down the main cage, they walked across the 300 feet, 350 feet length of the mine, and then took that staircase down. The morning of the lunchtime of the disaster, uh, a cart of hay came down to feed the mules that were kept in the mine. These mules were kept in total darkness. They lived in the mine. If they came up for medical reasons, they said, and they were going to put these mules back down, they went absolutely insane. You can imagine. You can't imagine working in a coal mine. I, until after I wrote the book, I did not go into a coal mine. And the one that I went into was in Virginia, and it was bored into a mountain. But when I tell you that it, there is no light except for the, the light, the grease called sunshine that the miners burned in their helmets or the, the torches they carried, you cannot see your hand in front of your face. And so that morning, the lunchtime thereabouts, the hay came down to feed the mules just as coal was coming up. And so the young men who were working at the cage offloaded the hay to get the coal up. Well, the cherry mine was, as, as Dean mentioned, was the epitome. It was declared, the tipple was declared fireproof. It was the jewel. It was outfitted with electricity throughout. Except for one thing, three weeks before the disaster, there was a short circuit in the wiring, and the electrical wiring was out, and they reverted back to the kerosene torch method of lighting the coal mine. And so, the, so when these young men pushed the hay cart off, they, they parked it underneath a kerosene torch. Now, you can stick a blowtorch to cut hay, and it won't burn. In fact, many of the mines used hay in the mule stables to create partitions but it's felt that the kerosene dripped into the hay, it was an accelerant, and it caught the hay on fire. As some of these men were leaving at lunchtime, they saw the fire, they thought they might have been able to put it out with their coats, but what happened was it was sitting in the air shaft, so the, so the, ventil the air is coming down, somebody opened a, do a door, um, young trapper boys stayed in the mines, and their job was to open the door to let the, the mule carts through with the coal or with the, with the empties, Somebody opened a door, it fanned the flames, and coal in the earth, the strata is that shale is underneath it, and that's why you have a lot of cave-ins in the mines, because the shale breaks loose and causes cave-ins. So to shore that up, the mine was buttressed with pine timbers. So you've got a flaming hay cart, air coming in, fanning the flames, licking the timbers, and before you know it, you've got the whole roof of that second vein on fire. The story is one of heroism, cowardice, um, people trying to, to cover their behinds. The fire is out of control. They're trying to dump the coal car back onto the cage to get it down into the third vein where there's a pump, where there's water, where they can put it out. Actually, within 45 minutes, they, they do get it down there and finally get the thing put, the hay put out. But by this time, the second vein is all on fire. Coal is still coming up. The call starts going back into the mine to escape the mine, except you have all of these immigrants who don't speak English, and you have people running through the saying, get out, get out, get out. And then by, by the time the fire gets over to the wooden staircases, and to that, it, it just completely burns out the staircases, and so the guys in the bottom vein have no escape. You have... Um, of the, 253 to 259. The coroner only, his report only has 253 bodies. I think all of us have come up, the number that's been going has been 259 men and boys died in the disaster. Some of the boys were underage. There were 
I have eight boys who are underage.